What's the worst defense you've seen someone make in court? I took a guy to small claims court. His defense was, I didn't have the product, so I couldn't ship it to him, obviously. The judge was like, but you took his money. Yeah, so I could buy the product and ship it to him. Did you do that? Not yet. Do you have his money? No, I had an emergency and had to spend it. And that was that. I won. I feel like for any small scale business whatsoever, that is a terrible decision to use the money to buy the product that you are selling someone. So much can go wrong, so much. Alternatively, maybe this is how business works and I'm just ignorant. Who knows? I'm sure someone in the comments does. Story two. I saw this go down while waiting for my traffic ticket. Judge. So you were seen pulling a stop sign out of the ground and throwing it into the river. Uh, yes, sir. Were you drunk? No, sir. The ticket says you were intoxicated. Uh, no, sir. Okay, let's say I believe you. I will throw out this drunken disorderly charge. Uh, thank you, sir. But I will have to charge you with the destruction of government property and endangering the public. That comes with at least a year in jail. So I'll ask one more time. Were you drunk? I yes, sir. Very drunk, sir. Story 3. A domestic abuse case. The husband was the accused. The couple was in their late 70s or early 80s. When asked if he did indeed abuse his wife, the husband started complaining that some 40 years ago the wife pretended to be ill, and he had to do the laundry all by himself, as if he expected the judge to just be like, Oh, okay, I guess that's cool then. Story 4. I was in traffic court and the first guy to go before the judge got pulled over for doing some crazy speed, like 140. The judge essentially told the guy to say he wouldn't ever do it again and that it was a mistake. And in return, the judge would drop the ticket fee and the points on his record. The guy countered with, Well, I drive that fast all the time, so I'm really good at it. And I don't think it was dangerous at all because of how good of a driver I am. Guy could have walked out totally free, but instead got a $2,500 fine and two points on his record. Talk about digging your heels in or shooting yourself in the foot, something. Whatever this guy did, it was stupid and bad and dumb. Story 5. Friend of mine once got a ticket for leaving her car standing in the marked off no parking zone in front of a grocery store, which she thought was outrageous because she was just running in to get a pack of smokes. Then she saw how much the ticket was for, something like $120, which she thought was just ridiculous as well. She was just running in for a pack of smokes. I mean, come on, how is that worth $120? So her plan was to go to court and contest the ticket, and point out to the judge how ridiculous that was and offer to compromise at maybe like 40 Because for Pete's sake, she was just running in for a pack of smokes and let's be reasonable here. Yes, you heard right. Her plan was to haggle with the judge. So she goes to court and sits there most of the day waiting for her case to be called. And eventually she gets bored and goes outside to grab a smoke and hang out. While she's out there, her case is called. She missed the whole thing. Didn't even get to try the whole, come on, for $120? What's that? Come on, I'll give you $40 and even that's highway robbery. Defense on the judge. And got hit for the full value of the ticket, plus court costs. It does not come as a surprise to me that someone who thinks they can haggle with the judge would also be the kind of person to miss their hearing because they were out smoking or something. I don't know. They were there. They could have just, they just had to wait. They just had to wait for their case. Admittedly, I don't think it would have been very fruitful either way, so maybe just saved the judge a headache, to be honest. Story 6. I was a juror for a case against a woman that was charged with selling a stolen gun to a pawnbroker and possession of a gun by a convicted felon. She took the stand and admitted to finding the gun at a friend's house and taking it to the pawnbroker. Her attorney's entire closing argument was that the state failed to prove that it was a gun and the charges should be dropped. Never mind the fact that she admitted to it being a gun. The guy that owned the gun said it was his gun. And we had it right there in front of us. The defense said it was not a gun because the state had not fired it to prove it was. And of course, as soon as we get back to the room to deliberate, one of the other jurors said he was not convinced it was a real gun. That was a really long day. Story 7. A guy was in court for a DUI, and he insisted on taking the stand when his lawyer advised him not to. Turned out he wanted the judge to know the cop who arrested him was just some rude kid trying to be a big shot, and I wasn't even drunk. I'd only had two bottles of wine with the dinner. His lawyer interrupted him to try to get him to stop talking, and he told his lawyer to shut up. Then the judge advised him to listen to his lawyer, and he told the judge, I'm not a damn child, don't interrupt me. And the judge just smiled, sat back, and said, Please, proceed. We all knew it was over for this guy. He got maxed on the charge, and advised in the future that if he was going to pay for a lawyer, he should listen to him. Story 8. Intimate assault trial we had this past summer. Guy brutally assaulted a woman in a park, then took her bike and ATM card. A few minutes later, he is recorded withdrawing $80 from her account. He is arrested within hours of the assault. At trial, he testified that the banging was consensual, and the victim enjoyed performing oral on him so much that she gave him the bike and ATM card to show her appreciation, and that someone else came along and beat her after he left. 
He also practiced his planned testimony with an inmate, who had just been sentenced on a gun charge and bragged about the assault in detail. That inmate threw him under the bus and testified against him. Gun charge inmate freely admitted he hoped that the guy would wind up in the same prison as he did so he could hand out some wreck yard justice. Running dope and guns was one thing, but he couldn't tolerate someone assaulting a woman. It didn't take long for a guilty verdict and a life sentence. I can't imagine what goes through a piece of garbage's mind like this, let alone carrying out the act telling an inmate about it, like, in detail, and expecting them not to rat on you. Because, uh, yeah, intimate offenders do not have a great record in jail. Not much respect to be gained from a crime like that. Story 9. I was the bailiff on a kidnap-slash-intimate assault case. The defendant was pro per, acting as his own attorney. During jury selection, he had the option to wear civilian clothing instead of his jail clothes. He chose to remain in his jail attire, complete with handcuffs and waist restraints. It came time for him to cross-examine the victim. Understandably, she was very upset before he even started. She was crying and refused to look at him. The defendant's first question went like this. You seem upset. Does it make you nervous to be questioned by the person that assaulted you? You could hear a pin drop in that courtroom. He was found guilty and sentenced to 46 years to life in prison. Edit. Several questions about the defendant's motivation about asking that question. He was a big guy, but definitely not the sharpest to knife in the drawer. My personal take was he tried to ask, be questioned by the person you said slash accused assaulted you and flubbed it. I was talking to a seasoned defense attorney about the story and some others. His take on it was some defendants, for whatever reason, commit what they call ending yourself by court. Story 10. Lawyer here, bored at work and not wanting to get started on something, so... I've seen some very stupid stuff, though I mostly don't do criminal cases, so the stupid stuff I tend to see requires a bit of explanation. However, when I was in law school, I worked with a group that helped get restraining orders for people in abusive relationships. Family court in Queens was very much a cattle call situation, and it was easy to watch hearing after hearing, which I always found fun. On one particular day, there were two absolutely amazing hearings. One was a case of two gay men. The guy claiming abuse was a huge man, fat and definitely over 6'4". He was against his tiny partner. At first, the magistrate was very incredulous, likely thinking what we were all thinking about the massive size disparity between the two. When the tiny guy got up to speak, he started scolding his larger partner for saying things like that, and at some point he threw a pen at the bigger man. The bigger guy started to cry, and the little guy started taunting him. The other involved a man trying to get an ex-party order against his girlfriend, which is relatively rare. It happens, but the vast majority are women getting them against men. This time, however, before his particular hearing could start, a woman came into the courtroom flanked with two other women. They were all three straight out of central casting for what you'd imagine NYC gang women to look like. They walk in and see the woman's partner seated in the courtroom, though his hearing wasn't up yet. She immediately starts threatening everyone in the room, but especially the magistrate. The magistrate had escorted them out with the bailiffs, who called an extra. About 30 minutes later, the dude's hearing was up. The magistrate basically immediately granted the restraining order and said he'll put in a note for the full hearing about that woman's conduct. Story 11. When my cousin was on a jury for a domestic case, the woman was put in the hospital by her boyfriend. She was in a coma for 18 months and couldn't even appear in court. Apparently, the guy pushed her through a door and down the stairs. The guy's defense lawyer was actually trying to get him off with a lighter sentence. But then the guy opened his mouth and tried using the defense of, If she would've just listened to me about not touching my gun, I wouldn't have gotten so mad. I didn't think the push was strong enough to put her through the door. I didn't mean to put her in a coma, it just happens. When my cousin told me this, I couldn't believe it. He ended up spending three years in jail and is no longer allowed to possess weapons. He was deemed mentally incapable of handling such things. Yep, this is a pretty prime candidate of someone I do not trust with a weapon. Clearly has no concept of what level of force to employ in a certain situation. Awful behavior, awful person, hate it. Story 12. I gave testimony as a health professional in a child custody case. The mother wanted to revoke the father's joint physical custody of the eight-year-old girl. The issue was that girl was asked to wipe her father's butt, apply lotion, and wash wash his genitals. The father's case was that because he was obese, fatigued, suffering from frequent diarrhea, and taxed to take care of his own hygiene without assistance, it was acceptable for her to do this as long as she wore gloves to avoid contracting hepatitis C from him. He also argued that it taught her a lesson about compassion and caring for those unable to do so themselves, and helped them to bond. Truly incredible. Story 13. During law school in class, I had to defend a hotel manager who was putting hidden cameras in the rooms. I want to note this was probably a civil suit and motion to dismiss. I could only really argue the law, not facts. I.e., the goal is to convince the judge that the conduct, as alleged, was not unlawful. I couldn't really get into issues of evidence or if he really planted the cameras and so on, and settling was not part of the exercise. I had no ideas. 
case law was pretty much in thorough consensus that it is in fact unlawful to do that, yet I had to put something together for oral argument, and also answer questions from the teacher slash judge. It was a total disaster. I remained somewhat composed somehow, but I really had no argument. The best I could do was that it was a digital camera, and the files had never been opened or viewed as far as evidence showed. So in some sense, there never had actually been an image of the hotel guests, just a bunch of ones and zeros that could of course become a video as soon as someone opened the file with proper software. It was a crappy and unconvincing argument. Story 14. Wasn't legit court, just court to change my last name. I was 14 and wanted to change my last name to my stepdad's. My biological father had to be present for the appointment and sign off on it. It went something like this. Judge. Okay, if everyone will sign here, your name will be changed. Biological dad. I'm not signing. Why not? What if she gets pregnant out of wedlock? I want the baby to have my last name. Reminder. I was 14 years old, had never even kissed a boy, and I hadn't spoken to my dad in at least five years. The judge told him that was an irrelevant point and convinced him to sign the paper. I was glad to leave that part of my life behind me that day. Why would the biological dad even want that. What weird power play of control. Ugh, it's just gross. Weird man. Story 15. Mine is sort of a worst slash best defense sort of scenario. A few years ago, I was doing jury duty at the Crown Court in the Old Bailey. It was to judge this gang violence case against a Sri Lankan gang in London. Essentially, someone had gotten attacked with a machete in a car park and left for dead. There were six suspects in this trial, two of which had left the country. What was very clear was that all six of these people were in complete cahoots. Every one of these four came to trial and blamed one other, so no one got blamed twice but every one of them got the blame placed on them. Most of the evidence pointed to one of the guys in the trial, or one of the guys that had left the country. We had to vote not guilty because there was so much reasonable doubt against all of them that none of them could be prosecuted. Story 16. Traffic court. I was the defendant. I show up in a suit and tie and I'm waiting for my attorney. Judge is there. First part of the day is just making sure we all show up. And then the city attorney offers us a discount to plead guilty. First time offenders have to sign up for a class on safe driving. Other than that, 30% off the top. Always fight your tickets, people. Anyway, I wasn't going to accept a plea deal because I had an airtight case. Even my lawyer agreed. She was nice and actually listened to me and did the groundwork. So she shows up. I've already checked in and she and I refused the initial offer. She then tells me to go wait outside while the city attorney tries again to get me to take the plea and others. So the thing with traffic court is that the officer who wrote the ticket has to show up. My attorney was concerned because the guy who ticketed me typically shows up. We go back into court and I'm sitting there and a group of guys come in all wearing ripped jeans and graphic t-shirts with the dirty work boots. One of them looks familiar but I can't place him and figure it's just some more people waiting for tickets. They were the cops for the various cases. The judge was not amused. Their defense for their condition was that court was too early. Me and about 10 other people all had our tickets dismissed. I have the signed letter from the judge framed. We didn't have to say a thing. The poor city attorney, though. He looked like he was about to die when the judge asked to speak to him. Like, seriously, I honestly felt like he was walking to his execution. Story 17. When I was watching my sister get sentenced for a minor offense, I listened to the court's appointed attorney talk about this 18-year-old girl who was in trouble for hitting her 50-year-old co-worker's car and not telling anyone until the co-worker noticed. The co-worker was yelling and carrying on about how this obviously pretty concerned 18-year-old girl wouldn't even acknowledge her at work anymore, and how she found her cocky and disrespectful. Her court-appointed attorney basically just said, she told me she was afraid of you and wanted to stay out of your way while this was being worked out. And the woman screamed, That's ridiculous! As far as defending yourself goes, that was not a great way to do it. Story 18. Was in court for traffic violation in the state of Florida. I'm sitting with a room full of people who are also contesting their tickets. There was a lady who looked like she was a waitress who got up to make her case in front of the judge. She point blank told the judge in front of the officer that ticketed her that her violation was BS from a know-it-all cop. The judge then proceeded to ask why those charges were unreasonable. Her answer was parody level. I was drinking last night and woke up late. I couldn't lose another job, so I needed to be on time. She ended up paying $500 for wasting the judge's time in addition to her tickets. So it's not I didn't do it. It was an I'm irresponsible and needed to make up for it by going faster. Also being irresponsible. Incredible. 10 out of 10 defense. Story 19. The worst defense I ever saw was when my ex-wife was trying to take my son away from me. I previously, just a year before, won full custody over him due to abuse and conditions he suffered under her household. While she didn't conduct any of the abuse herself, she knew of it and did nothing, choosing her partner over our son. After that year was up, she still had visitation rights and the summer. She decides to take my son in the summer and refuses to give him back under this delusion that my custody was only good for a year. Now previously, I went easy on her in court, because in the middle of our first court battle, she gave up. 
because she didn't want all the terrible things about her to get out publicly. This time, in the attempt to save my son from what should have been treated as a kidnapping, I pulled no punches, and talked more about her and how she is unfit as a mother and unstable as a person. Her history of self-destructive and self-harming behaviors, which my son picked up on and thankfully through therapy no longer partakes in, such as self-mutilation, how she used to threaten to murder our son when we were together, and how she never put him first even when he was being abused, which led to me getting him in the first place. And a quick clarification, originally she had full custody of our son. I know how absurd that sounds, but the first time around in court during the divorce, I was absolutely screwed and unfairly so. Anyhow, the judge asks her about these behaviors, and she screams out in the middle of the courtroom that she doesn't want to hurt anybody else, she just wants to end herself. The entire courtroom was in shock and fell silent for a moment. Her lawyer just kind of slumps down, and that certainly was the nail in the coffin for her case. I didn't even have a lawyer, and I thought I was so screwed, despite being the stable and obvious parent my son should be with. When the judge gave the judgment in my favor, one of the reasons given was the erratic behavior my ex-wife displayed in the court. If anyone is wondering how my son is doing, he's doing great. He went from living with her and constantly missing school and poor grades and being frightened and abused all the time to a loving household, where he is now a perfect A student and hasn't missed a single day of school in over two years. He's happy and is a wonderful kid that I admire, because I don't know if I could do as well as he did if our roles were reversed. I can just tell OP is a good parent here. And I know it's impossible to know for sure, but I just have a good sense of it. The ability to look at the situation and be like, if I were my son here, I don't know if I would have done as well. That's a lot of empathy. Something that's really important as a parent, I think. Definitely not watching your child get abused and be like, eh, that seems like bad parenting. I'm no expert, but if I had to guess. It sounds like it took a bit, but the courts finally did end up putting the child with the parent who would give him the best life. I hope both you and your son are doing great now, OP. And also for the record, I hope your ex-wife has gotten the help she needs and might be making positive changes in her life, however unlikely it might be. I never want someone who is mentally unstable to stay mentally unstable. There are resources and help out there for pretty much everything, and although it sounds like she's done some pretty terrible things, I am always for a bit of a redemption arc. Maybe it's the optimist in me. Anyway, that is all the stories we have for today. Hopefully I didn't spout too much uninformed opinions about legal stuff. I try not to, but sometimes it slips through the cracks. If I sounded like an idiot about anything, I'm sure you'll tell me in the comments, and I'll probably deserve it. For now, though, thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day, or night wherever you are, and I will see you in the next one.